is anyone attending this uh, workshop, any workshop of mine for the first time today? Please raise your hands. Thank you. Is anybody here who has attended a workshop earlier? Thank you. <laughs> is there anybody who is not sure? <laughs> I am asking these questions to start the workshop on a lighter note so that uh, we don't get caught up in uh, pursuing a subject that belongs to consciousness at a level of the mind which is below the level of our innate consciousness. The mind is an apparatus. It's a computer. It is a machine. If we have a computer and use it, we don't say that is me. We say that's my computer. When we use the mind, we should say I am going to use my mind because the mind functions like a computer. But instead of calling it my mind, which I can use, we start identifying with the mind and become the mind and say, that's me. That's where a lot of errors come up. A lot of mistakes we make in life are because of identification with the mind. That there is no self but the mind. So the mind's logic becomes our only receptacle for getting knowledge. If a speaker comes, we start understanding what he is saying, how it fits in with our mental anticipation of what he is going to say. How do we interpret it, relate it to our earlier thinking, earlier experience? We don't let it flow to our consciousness. Okay, we are aware, sitting here, open, let's see what happens. We don't do that. The mind, which is a machine which we can use, becomes us and becomes therefore an obstacle to something reaching our own real self, which is consciousness. What is the difference between consciousness and mind? Consciousness is the motive power, the life force, the very substance which makes us come into existence and therefore makes the whole universe come into existence. If we were not having consciousness, nothing would be there. If we were conscious of nothing, we are not there. Consciousness makes us exist makes the self come into being. What does mind do? Mind does not make us come into being. The mind only makes us think about our being there. Makes us contemplate, think, reason. Acquire more things for memory. Put things into time frame. Look at the past and the future. Yesterday's, today's and tomorrow's. Here and there. That's what the mind does. It's a function. It's not the existence of the self. It's a function. Therefore, we should not be trapped by a small machine that the creator built into our heads and say, this is it. When we know that we are the users of that thing. We are the users of that machine and we have the right to use it as we like. Not let the machine use us as the machine likes. There are already too much already too many programs, too much programming done into this mind. We are all so heavily programmed, so conditioned. It's so difficult for us to get out of that rut. We are programmed by our birth, our upbringing, our education, our value systems, our belief systems, our knowledge, our certainty of what we know, our defenses against getting into something which is not appropriate. There is so much conditioning and programming which has already gone on in that mind. Then to use that programmed and conditioned mind as the only receptacle for knowledge and truth is limiting ourselves in a big way. So mind uses logic but let us not depend so much on it that we forget it is a machine. It's a very good machine incidentally. If we recognize that God the creator has given in this body a brain which functions as a mind and can give us the power to think and to reason and we can use it when we like, for the purpose we like. It's one of the best machines that has ever been invented or given to us. It's the most wonderful computer with the largest memory space known to us, which we are not using, very little of it we are using. With the largest number of processing centers available, very few of them we are using. With the most complex and wonderful system, of interneuron networking. It has not been done by any computer that we have invented. It's working fine. 
it's got so much capability. I'm not decrying the beauty and workmanship that has gone into the mind. It's wonderful. All I am saying is, let not the machine start dictating to us what we have to do. In some movies, we sometimes get frightened that in the future, computers may take over if we give them too much artificial intelligence. I laugh when I see them. I said, why are we talking of the future? That's come. We're doing it now. A computer was given with artificial intelligence and we have made it more superior to our own self. And that computer is the human mind. It was given to us to be used exactly like any other computer. Maybe we were better off when there was less intelligence in the computer and more in us. We have passed on our intelligence to the computer. We have passed on our innate intelligence to the mind. We do not distinguish between intellectual prowess and intelligence. We think one who is intellectually brilliant can use his mind well, must be very intelligent. Intelligence belongs to us. Intellectual prowess belongs to the mind. Let's distinguish between the two and not hand over everything to the mind. It is for this reason that I want to start by suggesting know yourself as distinct from your mind. You are not your mind. You are the soul. Consciousness. Consciousness cannot be trapped into a certain dimension and say this alone exists. If you trap consciousness into time and space and say this is consciousness, that's not it. It is consciousness trapped in time and space. What is that trap of time and space? Mind. You don't have mind, you don't have time and space. But you are still conscious. As I mentioned last night, when we have experience of love, intuition, beauty, joy, they don't require time and space. They come spontaneously, timelessly, from nowhere, within ourselves. And we get so much happiness when they happen. They don't require the mind. We don't think those things out. In fact, we think ourselves out of those happinesses. The happiness comes and we think hard about it. How did it happen? No, it couldn't be right. Intuition tells us something so positive, so real, and the mind reasons us ourselves out of it. Intuition and love give us a relationship with somebody. It's so beautiful. It's so natural. It is so unifying. It makes us identify with the person and the mind starts reasoning and arguing and takes us out of that relationship and turns love into hatred. It's happening every day. So we are missing out on our natural life by overindulgence with this little toy that we got, this computer, and we are overusing it. We should use it, but not overuse it. We should use it and not be used by it. We should use it, but not depend upon it. But well, that's what's happened. Why has it happened? For such clever people, there are people who say they are the cleverest people in the world, who say they have read all the books, and they have passed all the examinations, and got all the degrees, and they have attended all the workshops and seminars available. And they are now full, fully familiar with all the terminology and concepts that exist in this field. And yet they are fooled by their own mind. Why? Because all this prowess that they gained was itself being stored in the same mind. They were not strengthening themselves. They were not looking at themselves. They were only pumping more energy, more information, more data into the same computer. They strengthened the computer. So if the computer was having hold on them, it gained an even greater hold on them. So all this great study, research and education leads to our strengthening the very thing that stands between us and our knowledge of our own self. We have all done it. Why can't we relax and say, let's give a little vacation to our mind. Let's put it aside for a while. People have tried to do that. They say, well, if this is so simple, the mind is coming in the way, we are overusing it, let's put it aside. When they want to put the mind aside, after a relationship with the mind of almost identification, of love, when one loves one's mind, one is identifying with the mind, it's so difficult to put it aside. The mind fights like nobody's business. You will try today. Meditation is an example. When you want to relax and be by yourself, 
and you'll see mind working at top speed over time. Those of you who've done it before know it. Those who haven't done it will see it. The mind is fighting for its very survival. As if we are going to lose something. That the mind is going to die or something. It won't leave. It doesn't want to go even a little further away. Supposing in the head you say, okay, I want to sit in the center, thinking mind, step aside half an inch and wait here for me. It won't do it. It wants to grab you back. Grab with what? With thoughts. It's only manifest form. Fortunately for us, the mind does not have too many manifest forms. It can't fool us too much. Its form is thought. Thoughts will come. No, what about this? Spoken thoughts. Visual thoughts. We'll hear the sound of the mind speaking and we can see the thoughts written right across in images and words. The mind is very simple in its expression. But it will not let go. And people wonder how in the process of trying to meditate, we encounter so much thinking in the head. Why so many things we have forgotten? We don't want to think about. They come at that time. The mind fights for keeping hold of something it has got over a period of time. The mind has become really strong. Now comes another problem. The mind is holding on to some very essential data. It is holding on to our secret. It is holding on to secrets that we never wanted to share with anybody. But we thought we are having with ourselves, but we are sharing with our mind. We forgot that we shared our secrets already. It is holding on its memory chips and memory spaces. It is holding on all our previous experiences. Not only experiences of yesterday and the day before and of childhood and of birth and of pre-birth stage, prenatal stage, but even of past lives. It is holding on the experience that consciousness has had ever since the beginning of creation. That's a powerful thing, to hold on so much material, all inside every individual head. Each one of us holds on the memory chips of this mind the entire experience of consciousness from inception, if there was an inception. And if there was no inception, the entire experience of eternity with infinite time. That's too much material. We have taken, we have been now held hostage by the mind because of the information it holds. And what does it do with that information? It uses that information to create the results in front of us, visual and sensory results in front of us which we gleefully think is our life. We think what is happening around us is our life. We don't realize it is just the mind spinning out. The results in front of us based upon all the imprint of the past that is holding inside. What we call life outside is nothing more but the working out of the previous impressions the mind is holding. It holds some impressions specifically. You hurt somebody that comes back and that person comes up in front of you and hurts you. You don't like somebody, person comes up, the hatred returns and you want to get back at it. All these little incidents of great significance in the past come back again. We call it the law of karma. Karma means action. Why do we call it law of karma? Because karma is action and we believe that every action leads to reaction. Therefore, comes the adage, as you sow, so shall you reap. Whatever we have done in the past has not been forgotten because we stored it in our own mind. We thought maybe with death, the mind goes. We thought one good turn would be when we die in the physical body, at least the mind goes. We were mistaken. The mind survives. The mind survives physical death. The mind even survives ethereal, astral death. The mind survives, just doesn't die. Therefore, the mind carries on along with the soul. The soul is immortal, can never die. So what is this kind of attachment that has bound these uh, mind-soul 
principles together in us that the consciousness which is the motive force which gives birth to all creation and all experience tied down with a mind that puts it into this frame of time and a past and a present and a future that they should so bind themselves together that we can't get out of it. We can't even die out of it. Every time we die, we come back again. If we say, no, no, we don't want to come back here. We want to have a better place. The mind says, fine, there's a better place. And you go to the better place. And the mind carries everything to the better place. It never loses what it has. So the mind that I am speaking of is much more than a simple toy. It's a very powerful computer. It's holding all this information. Some of these specific actions of the past, the karmas of the past, come back as reactions. And we call it the pralabdha karma or the destiny of man. Human destiny is nothing more than the mind playing out the events of the past. We come and say, why are these things happening to us? There is no reason for it. There is no logic for it. Our own intellect doesn't explain why things are happening to us in a certain way. And so we have recourse to this good formula. It must be past karma. It must be the past action. That explains it. So we accept it. If there is no other explanation, the past actions explain it. It explains for those who believe in reincarnation. It explains for those who don't. Because those who believe in reincarnation they say we must have done in a past life. Those who don't have no other explanation. Therefore, they accept it. Therefore, the law of karma has become more popular than the law of reincarnation. And I find people who do not believe in reincarnation accepting the law of karma. Of course, one can make fun of it too. Some people don't believe at all. Like that uh, cartoon I saw once. A big yogi, <coughs> fat yogi, pouring out from a large flask was pouring out what was captioned as karma cola, <laughs> distributing it. But apart from the joke, apart from the lightness of it, the point is our actions and reactions in this life, our destiny in this life, the way things are unfolding and happening, some of them cannot be explained by the contemporary local situation. We cannot even explain a relationship. Why do we hate a certain person? There is no reason for it. Why do we love a certain person? There is no reason for it. Why do we enter into an accident? We took all the precautions. There is no reason for it. Why do we fall sick? When we follow the right nutrition and the diet. Why do we remain hungry when we eat all the junk food? There are so many things happening. We can't explain them. Because they don't follow the so-called rational laws that we think are governing us and which are acceptable to the mind. These are things happening because the mind is a string of experiences coming from the past. Those experiences which occurred in the past and are creating incidents in this life are called destiny or pralabdha or fate. Those actions which we are now creating without relationship to those through the device of free will, human free will, where we decide between choices and options. Should I do this or do that? When this game goes on in the mind of choosing between different alternatives and options. This use of free will, that free will puts us down again into a fresh karma, into fresh action. Because we can only act when we can decide. We can only decide when we have choices. When we have choices and we decide, that is not called destiny. Destiny is what we decided earlier and we have getting incidents and accidents which we can't explain. But what we are now doing is true karma for the future, action for the future, which will create future destiny. The mind is very happy. Nothing makes this mind more happy and more secure than our taking decisions every day, more and more decisions, so that we are sure of a future destiny in this very level of creation which we call the physical plane. Therefore, the more decisions we take, the more we are vacillating, this or that, this or that, I can decide, I can, now I'll decide. That's where the new karma is being created. And that is where we are ensuring a future destiny, either in this life or in a future life. This action is called real karma or action. First one was fate or destiny, this action. 
But supposing all the fate, all the destiny, the previous action that we brought with us cannot be accommodated in our small human life because we must have lived millions of times. If, it's, if time is eternal, we must have had experiences all the time. Where does that all go? It splits into two parts. What cannot be accommodated as destiny in this life splits into two parts. One is the general effect of all the print on our mind, which we call sanskar, attitude. We come with an attitude. We have a certain attitude towards life, attitude towards people, attitude towards truth, attitude towards belief. It is so strong, attitude and style. It runs through everything we do. It runs through the whole of our destiny. And that is called sanskar or attitude which is coming from the totality of the imprint on our mind. And then there is some of the specific events which could not be held in this life which are held back in the reservoir of the mind to be put down as an imprint later on. And that's called the sinship or the reserve karma. The karma of the past which cannot be accommodated for being worked out now and therefore is held in reserve. We have been excellent in putting things off. We like to put these things off, especially the bad ones. Say, so we can't face it now. Let's put it off. We can't pay our bills. Let's put them off. We have to pay them one day. So what happens is, we have accumulated so much. And the more we accumulate, the more happy we make our little machine. It says, now I have enough time to live. Deep. These people can't get out. We have enough karma already accumulated in the sinship, in the reserve to produce 100, 200 lives in the future. Where will these people go? We are trapped by a little machine, an adjunct to our own consciousness. Did you know how it works? Have you gone inside and seen the functioning of your brain and your mind and the thinking process and seen that these things are happening? Have you traveled on your mental line of the past and future and seen that it's actually happening? I'm not giving you a theory. I want you to go in and watch your own mind and look at your mind and see whether these imprints are there, whether you are so totally conditioned and the mind is so happy and so much in power, does it let you go? All these things that I say to you in these workshops are verifiable. I don't want to give you any hypothesis and theories which have not yet been determined by personal experience to be actually existing. Therefore, whatever I say is subject to personal verification by any one of you. Go in and see. But we have never done it. We don't even distinguish between the mind and ourselves. We don't even know who's experiment. It's all dark. We don't even close our eyes. It's too dark inside. We want to look for light outside. Outside, listen to somebody, read books. You don't want to go in. Go in, you can see the mind. If you want to be the self, that is pure consciousness, pure awareness, the very substance which makes things exist and happen. Not how they happen. How they happen is determined by the mind. Just happen. If you want to be the spirit where once in a while you have had that feeling of love, intuition, it just came. You know what it means. You know what happens to consciousness when those experiences come. If you want to be that self and not the thinking, worrying, groaning self, then try and look at your own mind. Watch your own mind. Some of you have done this exercise before, some haven't. It's a good exercise to try and watch your own mind. Where do you watch it? Wherever it's working, wherever you know where your mind is, your mind is all over the world. It's thinking of that place, this place, this thing I have to do, that chore I did not complete. My children are there, my parents are there, my sweetheart is there. All these things that are, thing, uh, that are going into the mind, they are distributing the mind all over the world, all over creation. How can the mind be distributed? It can be distributed because it's not one physical thing. The mind consists of these strings of awarenesses that create thoughts. If you start thinking of the next room, your mind through one of the strings goes there. 
And what is the string called? These strings through which the mind floats around into an outside physical universe. These strings are called the strings of attention. We give our attention to things outside and the mind goes along with the attention. Wherever our attention goes, part of our mind goes there. When we scatter our attention to too many things, our whole mind becomes scattered in too many things. So, attention is the vehicle through which the mind can travel outside of the physical body. At this time, the mind is traveling all over the universe. Because older memories, what happened earlier, the tensions, the subconscious problems which we are trying to hide and not face, all these are creating different strings of attention flowing in different directions outside and inside. Most of them associated with some earlier event where the mind gets dragged on. If we really sit in meditation and say, how am I situated with my thought process? And just let free association of ideas come, free flow of thoughts. We would be amazed at the amount of strings we have scattered all over. We would be amazed how much we have thinned our own self by so much of scattering of our attention. I am drawing this to your attention so that you should know when we want to sit within the body, these distractions will present a problem to us that we are not really here, we are in too, too many places already. We have to learn the art of putting our attention back from where it is flowing out. We have to learn the art of withdrawal of attention. If somebody can practice withdrawal of attention, one can have the most successful meditation. If you want to find answers to all the questions without listening to any more of my lectures, my words or my workshops, just practice this. The day you will do it, you will get all the answers. Withdraw your attention to the very point from where it is going out. All the answers are there. What place is that? That is where the self is. Wherever consciousness is operating to throw attention out from, if you can get the attention back to the same spot, you are back to your own self and all the answers are there. You will not have to ask me any question whatsoever. Answers will come rolling on as you withdraw, not when you reach there, as you withdraw. Answers to questions which you never thought of. Where are they coming from? Not somebody speaking answers in your head, but awareness is coming and knowing, ah, that's it, ah, that's it, this is it. It will happen so automatically. This is the secret. If you can withdraw your attention to your own self, which self means where it's originating from, going out from, you get all the answers. Yet, we have time ourselves so much with those outside poles where we take the string out and tie ourselves. We don't merely take it out as a probe. Okay, I want to see that person. Good, I have seen the person and now I pull my attention back. No, once we go to that other person, then we like that person. Then we want to be attached to the person, then we tie our attention there. So then when we get back, the string is still there. Then we want to do meditation and that person comes up in the meditation. Why? Because our attention is being drawn there. We buy a new car, it's a pretty car, it, it draws our attention and we want to see it and we see it, enjoy it and we take a strand of our attention and tie it around the car and then we want to sit in meditation and the car comes in front of us. It's natural. Sometimes you have to draw attention. Like I was advised to wear today a very bright colored sweater. I was told people in the back row may not see you at all. Sometimes people in the front row don't see me. <laughs> Maybe the color of the sweater may, uh, may draw the attention. I am making a point that the attention is what ties us down to attachments. We have a desire for something, we like something, we get attached to that something, to someone, to something and those attachments then keep on tying the strands of attention there and when we want to meditate to withdraw attention, those very things where we are tied up become obstacles and don't let us come back to our own self. We have lived our life like that, so be ready for it. Don't say, why doesn't my meditation work? When we have, meditation will work when we can deal with these problems. 
We can't run away from them. We created them. It's not somebody else's experience we are trying to resolve. It's our own. We are not solving anybody else's problem. We are solving our own problem. We set it up. It may not be a problem, but we set up a situation. We want to experiment something else. Remember the situation is there. The situation of attachments and the attention being bound elsewhere and we have to pull it back. It requires practice. Depending upon how strongly you are tied and how many strands of this string have gone out and tied you, it takes time. We are used to it. Whenever we do any practice, we want to walk. If I am tied out, my leg is tied with a lot of ropes and I try to walk, I have a problem. If I can unloosen the ropes one by one, I can walk. If I unloosen all, I can run. So, if you want to jog into the inner beauty and have the journey running along, flying, jogging, you have to deal with these ropes and strings that are tying you into attachments around in this world. And if you can deal with the problem of those attachments, it will be much easier to take the journey within. During the course of this workshop today, we will do some exercises which help us to practice withdrawal of attention to our own self. I propose to go through some simple exercises where we can see how this difficulty has been created for us, how we can overcome the difficulty by practice and consider the body as, a, as the housing of our consciousness and therefore of our totality and to go within the body. That is stage one. After we have practiced going within this body and going to the area of consciousness, then we will have to practice how to go within the sensory body. Because this body, the physical body, is not functioning by itself. It is also functioning through a dispersed consciousness called the sensory system. The dispersed consciousness overtakes this physical body and gives us a sense of sensation, all the nervous system that works and gives us messages into the brain, into the mind and gives us the knowledge of what's happening not only in the body but outside is through the sensory system. It then locates itself in sensory organs and through the eyes and ears and nose and mouth and the rest of the skin and body, we start having contacts with the rest of the world. This sensory system is located in the physical body to operate in total cooperation with the sensory body and the nervous system. They go together. If one gets out of place, the body by itself becomes senseless. It is nothing. It is dead. You can have a totally uh, useless body if the sensory system is not operating. If the sensory system operates, the whole body becomes alive and you feel there you are living and alive. You can be knocked out and the body is no good. The consciousness dispersed in the body through the sensory system is what is responsible for our contact with the rest of the world through this body. But of course, some people say, why should we call it a separate body? The sensory system is operating because of the life force, the vital force, which nobody has been able to explain, how it distributes itself in the body. When a person dies, why, doesn't, why don't the eyes continue to see? If the eyes were seeing, they should see. If a person becomes unconscious, why don't the eyes see even if they are open? Because it is not the eyes that are seeing, it's consciousness that is seeing. If the eyes do not have the consciousness dispersed behind them, they can't see. So, none of these sensory systems work. So, the, one can understand that sensory systems are necessary to make the body alive and have contact with the rest of the world. But one does not automatically jump to the conclusion that the sensory systems may be separate from the body till one has an experience. One has an experience if one can leave the body on the chair where you are sitting and walk out and stand here and look at yourself or look at the audience from here. If you could do it, then that means you have a system belonging to the sensory system which can be disassociated from the physical body. Actually, you have it all the time. If I were to say to you, keep sitting there, but come, only have the feeling, the experience of shaking my hand, and you do it. Will you try it now? 
stay in the body, but experience that you are walking to me, shaking my hand, going back and sitting there again. If you can do it, you will say, but that was imagination. It's true, we call it imagination. So what is imagination? Imagination is the ability we have to take our sensory systems away from the body. Is, but we don't want to believe it. We want to say, no, what is real is real. Imaginary means unreal. In fact, we use the word imaginary to mean unreal. And yet, the imaginary process is giving us the very experience we are talking of. An experience of disassociated sensory experience outside the body. So, imagination is not that imaginary as we might believe. But what makes that look imaginary? When you leave your body behind and imaginatively come and hold my hand here, let's do it. Please, imaginatively, imagine that you are walking across and shaking my hand. I'll hold my real hand, physical hand also here. So you hold my hand, shake it and go back. Those who have done it, please raise your hand. Those who have left, try again. Okay. Now, when you came and held my hand and went back, you had an imaginary experience of coming and going back. Why did it look imaginary? Because at the same time, when you were holding my hand, you were also conscious of sitting there. Is that true? You didn't forget that you were there. You were still there. So, you gave very small percentage of your attention to coming here. Maybe 1%, 2%, 5%. When you will make it 50% or over, you will not be there. You will be entirely here. Did you know it's that simple? You can try it whenever you like. It is a distribution of attention that is making one state of being more real than the other. And yet, because we give very partial attention to this activity, we have called it and dubbed it imaginative. Imaginative. But this imaginary self that came and walked was of the same shape and form as this body. Isn't that true? None of you flew like birds. You just flew in the same shape. So you imagine yourself to be in the same shape with the same sensory devices, same organs, and you come up and you have that experience and go back. This is in fact a sensory body that can outlive this physical body even at death. Very few people know it. That the very imaginary body that you just experienced has more survival than the physical body. It's more long-lasting. And yet we say it's imaginary. Why? Because we give more attention to the coarse physical being sitting here than to the imaginary stuff that went with consciousness. We give very little of consciousness to it. If we give more, it will be more real. How do we know it? You can determine it by practice. But this outlasts the physical body is revealed by near-death experiences, return from death experiences, reincarnation, little children telling what happened in past lives. When you go through those stories and those reports of which more and more are being documented, then you realize that what was thought to be a physical body, an ethereal light, that body had no weight. Did you notice the one that came to shake my hand had no weight? No weight loss problems at all. Don't have to go to any clinic or take any kind of special diet. It also had no gravity. That body which came could fly, yet it had all the senses, all sense perception. It's amazing. In fact, it was nothing more than sense perception. You will notice the form was given to it depending upon the physical form you took now and all it had was sense perception. It could start perceiving in the same way like these sense perceptions from another point. This outlives, but the mind goes with it. That body, imaginative body, doesn't have an indefinite life. After a while, when this body dies, that also dies. It has a different lifespan. But it carries the same mind and the same sanskars, the same attitudes with it. It carries the same memory with it too. We have called it astral body, ethereal body. Many words have been given. But they ought to be seen by practice. 
But supposing that body dies, what happens? Then the mind should also die with it. It doesn't die with this body. But when the ethereal, astral, imaginative, sensory body dies, the mind still lives. That can be experienced also. When you experience the existence of the mind without any body or sense perception at all, it still holds memory. It can still think. It can still reason. It can still have concepts. It can build new concepts without any bodies at all. How do we know all this? Where is it coming from? It's coming from a practice these mystics and masters shared with us and which was called How to Die While Living. You have heard that phrase? And Paul said in the Bible, I believe, I die daily. And the mystics in the East have always said, unless you can die daily, you can't have this real knowledge. If you can die daily, die at will, die while living, then only you can have this. Because their idea was, it is only a philosophy. That one body will outlive, soul is eternal. These are philosophies, these are theories. But why not practice and see if they really exist? If this body dies and the ethereal body lives, either we wait till we die. And if we see it lives, we can't come and tell our friends here. We're gone. And if we come in the other body and tell them, they say we are being haunted by ghosts, we don't want that. The very people we love, we don't want them after they die. Because they become spirit. We don't want to be affected by them. So how do we share this information with people we love dearly and whom we want to share all our knowledge and secrets? The mystic said it can be done by dying while you are living. That means while you are living in the physical body. Without actually physically dying, if you can experience the process of death, then you can find out what happens to the rest of your system, of your conscious system. Therefore, they studied what physical death does to us. And they found physical death is no more than the withdrawal of attention from the body itself, from the extremities right up to the head, to the brain. And they watched people dying and they saw how a person dying is losing the consciousness from the extremities, from the tips of the fingers and the, and the toes, from the toenails, it's going backwards and a person is still talking to us and is unaware of these extremities, is losing the awareness or the consciousness and gradually coming up when it comes to the brain, the body is dead. There is nothing left in it. It's gone. So we know the process of death itself is the withdrawal of attention from the extremities of the body right to the brain, to the center, where consciousness in wakeful state is operating. Therefore, they said, can't we induce this experience through a meditational process and see what happens? So they began to cut all those outside attachments. It took time. But gradually it was no longer so much pull that they had to remain out. Eventually when it came to the body, they found after a while when they did that, they were not aware where the feet were, where the hands were, where the legs had gone. And that meditational process made them unaware of their physical body in the same order, exactly like people who were dying. And gradually the attention came and when it came close here, they saw they were as alive as before in their consciousness and they got up and they found they got up without the physical body. And they looked and the body was still trying to do meditation. They said, what is this? And they walked about and they said, this couldn't be imagination because it wasn't. The one that thought there was imagination was sitting there. And that actual experience that the sensory systems can carry away the self with it. Not merely carry a particular experience of walking to a stage. It carries the self with it. That when the whole of it is carried away, it becomes our new body. And they saw that. It worked. They said, this is it. Then they could go to the next stage of experimentation, which they had heard in theory. What about withdrawing attention from the senses in that sensory body? To the same spot within the sensory body from where senses were operating. The imagination was operating. So when they withdrew their attention by dying while living in the sensory body, in the astral body, they found that the astral body was also vacated, given up. 
and the mind was still alive and could float around without shape, taking any shape it wanted and yet carrying the memory of this body as well as all past bodies. They found that the mind could give, reveal much more of its memory secrets of the past than it could when clouded by these other two bodies. So it looked like we were being covered by these bodies. That these were not real self. That was a cover on the self. Of course, perfect living masters who had dwelt in love and beauty and joy and were close to the totality of creation within themselves. They found even that mind which looked like the self was also a cover. When they will draw attention within the mind to their own self without going through a thought process and they will draw attention to the center of consciousness from where the thoughts were emanating in the causal or thought body or mental body or causal body being the cause of all the lower bodies. They found they were freed from the time and space trap that the mind was creating and they were eternal and there was no such thing as being bound by a beginning and an end. They found they were really free at all times, at all times were one, that they selected a frame whenever they wanted. They made time as they did required, that they made time as much as they made events. They found it by personal experience. And after all this experience and finding the truth of this consciousness and finding how it created the whole thing, they recreated, came back and shared with their friends and said, Friends, the truth is within everything, including God, the Creator, is within you. Go, go in. Go, go into the real temple. This is the real temple. Go into this body. Go to the next body, go into the mind, go to your own self. You will find the creator himself is sitting there and you are the creator. That's such a simple thing. They did it while in this physical body and shared it with their friends. Therefore, they said, we don't want to promise something in the future. Who is going to come and check up? We want to tell you something you can verify now. Do it now while you are alive. I remember my beautiful teacher, the great master in India, with a lovely, beautiful white beard, he used to laugh so much because it, it was too amusing how we were trapped in our minds. So somebody came to him and said, Master, in the next life, give me a real good human life, human body, so I can really get to know something. He said, Why are you a donkey or a dog now? <laughs> Why don't you do that now? What you are supposed to do in the next life? Why do you want a next life? You don't need any next life. Nobody needs a next life. We want to have the knowledge of the reality and truth inside now. Therefore, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I want to share this with you. That reality and truth and knowledge and all the answers are within ourselves. Practice going within, not out. Don't run after anybody. Don't run after anything. Run after yourself inside. Find the true nature of consciousness. How consciousness creates a tool for its own use called the mind. How the mind has got created the time-space programming which gives us so many lifetimes. How within that programming we create astral bodies to have a sensory experience, to be able to feel different things. How the sensory experiences fits into a physical body and creates a physical universe of such hardness and such density that looks real. How the whole experience becomes so real. How the reality, the essence of us, the essence of the soul was the creator, the totality. How the totality never broke up. God never split himself into little bits to distribute between us. The whole of God remained intact in the whole of the self and created illusion after illusion till the many were created for the same self to experience how this show is going on, how there is only one, that we are so many sitting here, none of us is experiencing more than oneself. It's strange. That's the truth. You can gather a million people, only one self is being experienced by them. Nobody says, I am experiencing here and there. You are only experiencing here. Nobody has ever experienced being split into two places. You can split a little bit of your attention here and there. The moment it slips over 50%, you are there. You are not here. You're all, always at one place. There's only one self. There never has been an experience of more than one self ever. 
all the others are other selves, not the self. One self is only one self, only one. So this experience can be acquired by the simple process. So simple, it amazes me. The simple process of withdrawal of attention to our own self, where it's operating from. Where do we withdraw? What point should we put our attention on? We should put our attention where we are. In what form? As consciousness. Awareness. As consciousness, where are we operating from? Consider our own body. It is obvious that we are looking at things through the eyes, but looking out through the eyes. Therefore, it's inside. We are listening to things through the ear, but what comes through the ear is inside. So, we are inside. We are not outside of this body. Consciousness is operating from within this body. Therefore, the point we have to put our attention on in order to withdraw is inside the body. And is it in the fingertips? Just contemplate. When you close your eyes, are fingertips closer to where you are or the head is closer to where you are? Contemplate yourself and you will find out just by your own experience that when you are contemplating on where am I? Where am I operating from? Where am I looking out? into this world from, it comes back to the head. If you go more closely, where in the head am I operating from? You come to the center of the head. If you say exactly where am I, then the exact location can be determined by this kind of introspection, by contemplation, by meditation, by going within. And you will find you are behind the eyes, almost in line with the ear. So you draw a line between the two ears and draw two lines behind the eyes. Geom geometrically, if you were to draw two lines behind the eyes and draw a straight line between the two ears and let those two eyes meet, let these two eyes going from, um, these two lines going from the eyes meet the line that is going between the ears and that becomes a bench. We are sitting in the middle of that segment as consciousness. How closely? As a point as a dimensionless point. Can we verify it? Yes, anytime. Anytime you want to find where is my consciousness proceeding out from, you close your eyes, contemplate and you will find you are there. But in the process of going there, lot of thoughts will come and take you away. Even not letting you perform the simple verification, where am I? Therefore, this ability to switch from a scattered attention outside to an attention inside the body is of great importance.